Hello and welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Seth McCoy, and tonight we have a wonderful show for you. On the first half of the show, we welcome Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiatives Executive Director Chris Jones and Boston Promise Initiatives Director Sheena Collier. For the past 30 years, DSNI has partnered with the community to rebuild their neighborhood and revitalize Roxbury. In honor of DSNI's 30th anniversary, we will be discussing the work of DSNI and the Boston Promise Initiative, the first ever comprehensive survey of the Dudley Village campus. And in light of October being National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, on the second half of Common Ground, we will rebroadcast a previous interview with Executive Director Stacy Malone from the Victim Rights Law Center. The Victim Rights Law Center is the first nonprofit nationwide network focusing on the legal needs of sexual assault victims. Stay tuned. And joining me now are Chris Jones and Sheena Collier. Welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having so, us. So I'm excited to talk about Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative because as we were talking off camera and off air, that is my neighborhood. Yes. I, as I talk often on TV and probably shouldn't, <laughs> uh, I live up on Fort Hill. So tell me uh, and, and tell people at home who might not know what DSNI is, what DSNI does. Great, great. No, um, thank you for having us, and we're very excited. Um, we DSNI is a community-based organization, which is actually Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, we were started 30 years ago. So this mm -hmm. year, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary, and I think the best way to capture it is an organization that that helps to empower resident voice mm -hmm. for residents to actually be able to create, plan for, and control uh, the creation of a vibrant urban neighborhood. And that actually came about because back 30 years ago the voice in Roxbury was sort of muffled, if you will. Yeah. And so people got together. I don't want to take your thunder from you, but <laughs> people got okay. together and said, you know, we're not going to sit back and let things happen to our neighborhood right. that right. we don't want happening here. So tell me a little bit about back then. I mean, obviously, none of us were around back then, <laughs> at least not in a, an active way. <laughs> but what are, what are the stories that you hear about how DS and I, how it was when it first started? Yeah, sure. No, you, you know, I think, I think one of the things that's fascinating is that that DSNI has been able to capture and tell the story mm -hmm. of the beginning. And not often do you find uh, organizations that are able to hold on and capture the beginning, the mm -hmm. early stories. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the things that I've heard are that as kids would go to school, they would uh, get sick to their stomach because of all the trash in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it was mm -hmm. a center of uh, illegal dumping. Yeah. Um, and at night, folks from outside the city would come in and just completely dump on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There were a number of arsons. Uh, it was in the center of redlining, and the Boston Fed yep. uh, did a report about redlining. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were lots mm -hmm. of vacant land and empty lots. Mm -hmm. And so the residents uh, came together and said, look, this is enough. Mm -hmm. It has to stop. Right. Uh, and that was our first campaign, don't dump on us. Uh, and, they, and they mounted a, a, a fascinating campaign. I think one of the, if I can quickly say it, one of the most interesting stories for me is that um, it was during the campaign season for mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the mayor, had, Mayor Flynn, had made a promise to, to address the, uh, the trash transfer, illegal trash transfer stations. Yep. Well, he didn't do it. Uh, and so the, the residents in the neighborhood said, all right, well, we'll employ a strategy. And they began to put his bumper stickers on the cars that were, that were illegally dumped there. <laughs> wow. And, and immediately uh, there was a response for them to begin to clean up. Uh, and not long after that, there was a big march uh, to one of the illegal trash transfer stations, and they locked it up. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. And that's, you know, I have to say, as you're telling that story, it reminds me that there's so much history in Roxbury. Yeah. Um, even just yeah. in my little neighborhood on Fort Hill, it's amazing to think that some of these stories don't actually get out beyond the neighborhood. Right. What is something, Sheena, that you've heard about Roxbury mm -hmm. that you wish people mm -hmm. all over the city and outside mm. the city would know about mm -hmm. Roxbury? I think one is, so I'm not from Boston, I'm from upstate New York, mm -hmm. um, and then moved here from Georgia. But you're not a Yankees fan. Um, not on, t not on TV, I'm not. Um, and so one of the things when I moved here, so I came here to go to grad school, mm -hmm. and what I think people don't really realize is the rich culture in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. And so even moving here, I came from an HBCU in Atlanta. And so the perception of Boston really, and I think it still is, is that it's a mostly white city mm -hmm. um, and that there isn't a lot of rich diversity in mm -hmm. cultural history. Right. And so I lived initially in Austin Brighton, um, didn't like Boston, and then I moved to Roxbury to Fort Hill as well. 
and really realize like how um, vibrant of a community it is right. and mm -hmm. how many how many stories there are to be shared and you're yeah. driving through and you see Malcolm X yeah. um, in Dudley Square and now you see Nelson Mandela on Warren Street yeah. um, so I think that that's a big piece of it it's just really how much history has taken place here for people of color right absolutely yeah. and what a close community Roxbury is yeah. I mean people do band together especially mm -hmm. if they see issues mm -hmm. and that's one mm -hmm. of the things mm -hmm. to be commended what about you Chris any stories that stick out from Roxbury's rich history? Wow, that's a great uh, great question. Um, you know, I think there are a number of things that fascinate me about uh, the history. In terms of Boston, so to your point, I'm, um, I'm from the South, mm -hmm. Arkansas, and mm -hmm. I, I came here via uh, an HBCU that's right next to the, the one that <laughs> Sheena went to, Historically Black College, uh, mm -hmm. Morehouse. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that I had always heard or always the image that is in our mind is the image of the attorney mm -hmm. uh, during the busing situation mm -hmm. where the student was was thrusting a flag Ted at him. Ted Landsmark. Exactly, that. exactly. And, and that image kind of burns in your head, mm -hmm. but when you get here, um, when you get here, you realize that that they're, they're, they are people that are dealing with the same opportunities and challenges that folks are dealing with all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, and what's what's unique and interesting about it is that it, with with a city with such history, is actually a small place, right. uh, and mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to get to know each other. And there's an opportunity to kind of kind of do cross cultural things. And so, what I think what fascinates me the most is the rich language. And so, one of the things that that um, makes DS and I stand out is that we do pretty much everything in three different languages, mm -hmm. um, English, Spanish, and Cape Verdean Creole. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get the texture of languages all the time. Now, I don't speak any other language, but that's okay. Uh, it's <laughs> but really, I'm enrolled in Cape Verdean Creole class right now. There Are you, you really? Yeah. Yeah. Is it hard to learn? Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it has a lot of differences from other languages. Right. A lot of some of the, like French, French, which I've took for years, even around conjugation and things like that. Right. But, being in the Dudley Street neighborhood, I mean, it's important, at least right. greetings, right. you know, right. to know basic, and be able to talk absolutely. to people. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about Dudley, though, because the whole area is just really transforming. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so talk a little bit about that, Chris. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's it's hard to figure out where to start. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah it, it really is. There, you, you could take a, a look at the Uplands Corner area mm -hmm. and, uh, and the... the arts and culture vibrancy that's that's emerging or you can uh, take a look at the actual Dudley Square area uh, and, and with the with the school department coming in mm -hmm. with the rich sort of focus on innovation mm -hmm. uh, there's there's lots of, of activity and excitement and I think the thing that we are focused on is in the in the midst of all the activity and excitement how are we ensuring that resident voice is heard mm -hmm. uh, and how are we ensuring that those who uh, so that as we create more opportunities in the neighborhood, those who are there continue to have choice. Absolutely. How? What are some of the ways that you do that? Because mm. obviously there is a lot of development happening. There are a lot of questions that residents are going to have to be faced with, with you know, density and height and right. this and the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you help the the community voice their concerns, mm -hmm. Sheena? Yeah, so around the physical space that you're talking about, we, um, you know, that's a lot of what DSNI is known for and yeah. kind of what we started around. And so we we continue that work um, specifically around sustainable and economic development. Mm -hmm. And so we have a pretty robust committee that actually, um, when you want to come in to develop something in our area, developers know that they come to um, present to our committee. Right. And so it's a committee of residents who are asking really important questions around how is this going to affect my neighbors, how is it going to mm -hmm. affect me, is it something that's going to benefit this neighborhood or not? Right. Um, so we've been seeing a, a rise in that lately. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's happening a lot more yeah. um, where we're really trying to make sure that questions um, that residents have are getting raised to developers um, mm -hmm. and to the city and just to be able to really have conversations about who's coming in and out of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I think that people recognize that DSNI is a place where they need to come have those conversations. Absolutely, because with all of this development, and yes, it's great, but it does have its drawbacks. There are mm -hmm. you know, concerns about pushing neighborhood folks who have been there for a really yeah. long time out because rents will go up yeah. or people will buy a property and, and redevelop. Yeah. Um, jobs that might be there right now might not be mm -hmm. available down the line. So there mm -hmm. are a lot of things that need to be answered. Chris, any comments on, on that? Yep, they need to be answered. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you I know, know. <laughs> it, 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 it is it is enormously complex, yeah. um, and yet uh, uh, our approach, as Sheena mentioned, is consistently engaging residents uh, mm -hmm. because I think the creative 
power of having residents that are informed mm -hmm. and engaged um, and have a stake in the in the future makes a difference. Uh, so we've de just really quickly we've de deployed a couple strategies. Yep. You know, one is around, as Sheena mentioned, around the physical space. We actually um, we we have land that we own through our land trust, mm -hmm. and that land is permanently affordable land. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's uh, home owners or agencies that have homes that they rent or the food project that runs a, a farm and a greenhouse, uh, what they can rely on is that there's permanent affordability uh, in that space. And that's one of the tools that we have to use uh, to fight against uh, any forces that might push others out. That's great. One of the things, as you were just talking, reminding me, when you're talking about getting that collective voice, voting. Yes. Obviously, we're, we're sometimes lacking in the city with, with voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you encourage members and not only of on the boards but also in the community to make sure that you know using your voice in these meetings is a great opportunity, yeah. but also using your voice at a polling location to actually vote for somebody or mm -hmm. an yeah. initiative is also what needs to happen. So I don't know how if you got it might be kind of like a gray area for you. But uh, <laughs> Chris is like, no, it's not. <laughs> no, voter education um, is really important to us. And so every, so at a minimum, every election, we're making sure that uh, residents are getting a voter guide mm -hmm. so they know who's on the mm -hmm. ballot mm -hmm. and they are um, reminded about the importance of going out to vote on that date. Mm -hmm. Something really interesting that we did after the mayoral election, um, so you know, we had someone very close to DSNI that was in the mayoral election. Yeah. Um, and it really was exciting for it's the John neighborhood. Barrow, so yes. I, I'll say it. Yes. <laughs> John Barrow. Um, so it was really exciting for the neighborhood. And though he didn't go on to become mayor, it still was like, wow, right. we look at someone that's come up through DSNI, yeah. um, who's actually now. And he did for really mayor. well. And he did really for well. Yeah. 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 First time candidate. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was exciting. And so what we hosted uh, probably a couple of weeks after the election was a community conversation mm -hmm. um, back at DSNI for residents to be able to come and talk about, like, what is this mayoral race? mean like what does right. it mean that John got that did that well his right. first time out what does it mean right. for this neighborhood right what does it mean for the Cape Verdean population right. what does it mean for Roxbury and how so, can we now capitalize off of that and what were the results what does it mean and how do you capitalize on it yeah mm -hmm. well one some of the stuff that came out of it I mean people one just the the sheer excitement that people had around voting and right. trying to capture that and say it's great that John was in a race, he's not gonna be in every race, so right. how do we make sure we keep people excited about going out anyway? Right. Um, and so we talked about that a lot. And then this, the piece around voter education and just really people mm -hmm. understanding the importance of them voting. So though a lot of people came out because of him, um, we still didn't have the greatest turnout. Right. right. And so how do we um, find places to have those conversations about what it means to be civically engaged? And so that's something that we definitely continue to do. Um, around election time and then also thinking about in between, like how do we just help residents to understand their power. Right, absolutely. And November 4th, of course, is when people yeah. will go to the polls absolutely. again. So. Absolutely. And we, yeah. we've actually, um, so one of the things that we did this year was bring some of the gubernatorial candidates mm -hmm. to, to come to the neighborhood and mm -hmm. tour the neighborhood and and, uh, and see some of the things that are happening and meet some of the residents. And mm -hmm. I think that was good. And I would also say it's actually a, a very good um, move for us to both hear from them and share some of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the other, I would say the sort of the other piece that we are engaged in that is not directly related to the electoral process, but it is related to voting and, and the electoral process within DSNI, is that our board is a resident board that is elected every two years. Mm -hmm. And everyone, the entire board has to be reelected, um, or every seat has to be reelected uh, every two years. And that's our chance to say it, it is about voting, and voting extends beyond uh, the typical political positions, but it also includes your neighborhood organizations. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Mm -hmm. It's a great you know, lesson for everybody to, yeah. to stay active and engaged. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the Boston Promise Initiative. Mm -hmm. This is kind of exciting to me because it's another topic I like to talk about, which is improving the schools. Mm -hmm. um, so Sheena, I don't know if you want to talk about that since that's yeah. sort of like your, your baby, My if baby. you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Promise, our DS and I having Promise, our Getting a Promise grant really grew out of the work that um, Chris mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, so over the years we've been working on around resident leadership and how do residents control the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has been around our physical space and so promise is now taking it to uh, the level of how do we also do that around education mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so really focusing on continuing to focus on resident leadership but also parent leadership because yeah. we know here in Boston that the children in our school are not necessarily our residents right but they're also a part of promise mm -hmm. and considered a part of promise neighborhoods 
Um, so as you know, it's a federal grant and we're one of 12 promised, federally funded Promise neighborhoods in the country. Mm -hmm. And the idea is really that you're following children from birth to, to age 24, so children and youth. Right. Um, and figuring out what are the supports that they need in the neighborhood to move them successfully through the neighborhood. How do you, and how do you create this community where you don't have to go outside of your neighborhood to access quality? Right. So either quality schools, quality early childhood care, uh, quality post-secondary um, opportunities. Yep. And the way that we approach it is really around continuing what we do around partnerships. Mm -hmm. So, it's, mm -hmm. so DSNI continues to be organizers and planners. We're not service delivery organization, right. and so we're bringing together the organizations that are already doing great work in the neighborhood and finding people that are doing great work other places and want to bring mm -hmm. it to Roxbury and, and North Dorchester and saying, um, how can we come together as a collective and really support the about 7,000 children in this neighborhood under age 17. See, and I think that's so innovative because for years I've looked at, not just in this sector, but in different nonprofit profit sectors, and I feel like, you know, you have people doing the same kind of work, but right. they don't really right. talk right. to each other to figure yeah. out how they can work together to yeah. solve a problem. So Absolutely. to me, it sounds so great yeah. to have just you know, this one sort of umbrella, if you yeah. will, who yeah, will spread the message, yeah. so. Because it becomes confusing for families. Right. right. They, they don't, you can't figure out how to access right. um, if you have five people that are doing similar exactly. things. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, and there's hoops you have to jump through to even get involved in those. So right. our hope is to get to a place where there is one entry point for families mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. Yep. Uh, right now, it's we're really thinking about how do we even bring on just, um, really quality partners and how do we even figure out what quality is and really mm -hmm. using data to do that. Do you have partners already? How mm -hmm. does it, who are the partners that you're working yeah, with? Yeah, many, many partners. Um, <laughs> and and they, they are in a couple of different kinds of categories, but generally one thing that we've done really recently is figure out how do we fund or invest in some of the quality work we want to see in the neighborhood mm -hmm. to bring on more partners. And so we get roughly $1.2 million a year from the Federal Department of Education, and mm -hmm. we're giving out back over half of it wow. um, to yeah. other to residents um, and to partner organizations. And so we just did a process over the summer where we put out a request for proposals to community organizations mm -hmm. saying, here's the things we want to see in this promised neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, who can do it? Right. And so we got a, a number of responses, um, and now we have uh, nine new partners, nine some existing and new partners um, that will be implementing stuff for probably over a thousand kids in a neighborhood uh, from birth to eighth grade. That's amazing. And, and I would just add that I think this ties back to our original mission, mm -hmm. uh, which is about creating a vibrant urban neighborhood right. in collaboration with community partners. Mm -hmm. right. So that has always been a strand, and now through the work that we are doing and Sheena's doing through the Boston Promise Initiative, we're able to realize it um, in, a, in a, at a whole different magnitude and in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's it's great. Does this tie into the Dudley Village campus at all? How does it all yes. tie oh in? Oh my goodness, I was <laughs> even studying. <laughs> yes, yeah, so so um, in DSNI, as we originated, we talked a lot about an urban village. Mm -hmm. So if you look back at DSNI documents, and we have so many documents at the office <laughs> mm -hmm. from even back in the 80s, yeah. wow. and it talks about creating this urban village yeah. and really um, a village being you know a, a community of caring adults. Yeah, and so when we got promise or even a little preceding promise and thinking and starting to think about education we added on the campus part mm -hmm. and so what that means is we're creating a village of caring adults that really um, are supporting this neighborhood of continuous mm -hmm. learning so mm -hmm. thinking about a college campus and you walk around a college campus and you can access learning in different ways you can go to class you can be in a club mm -hmm. yeah. and so we want to figure out in our neighborhood how do not just our schools, but how are our businesses supporting learning, how are our residents that don't have children supporting learning, right. and really figuring out how to create a campus feel. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's It's so exciting to me. And, you know, again, as I said, I live up on Fort Hill, so I know just how active our little right. pocket of Roxbury yeah. is, but yeah. to think about it, you know, spreading yeah. all Absolutely. around yeah. the whole yeah. And for, and for us, it's, it's a, so in, in the field, if you would, mm -hmm. there, there's talk about place-based strategies and they talk about people-based strategies yep. and and we actually employ both a people-based strategy and a place-based strategy meaning we care about the place yep. and we care about the people that are in the place yeah. and so when Sheena talks about working with businesses and working with families right. and work but working within the Delhi Village campus that's what we do yeah and, and really I think that's essential to having a, a uh, strong vibrant community is having mm -hmm. people 
like me, like you guys who are involved, you know, if you see something in the neighborhood, you know, just be being on the lookout and, right. you know, if there's trash, picking up the trash, just exactly. being more engaged in where you live as opposed to, well, I only live here, this is what I do, I don't interact with right. people, right. Right. I don't care if that kid's acting out, you know, you know, yeah. I mean, you just, it's part of just being a community and, and looking out for other people. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. 30 years though. Yes. We talked about that at the top. Mm -hmm. So you have a big party coming up. Yep. We do. We <laughs> Chris, do. Chris, tell me all about the party. Yeah, yeah. You know, so before I say tell you about the party, I have to tell you about all that we've done this, this yes. year. Yes. Yes. Right? So uh, for, for starters, we're we're very excited about celebrating 30 years, and I think it's just a testament to all the hard work and the effort. Uh, for you know, at the beginning, it's a testament to the the, the mission and the vision of the organization. Um, and the hard work that has sustained it through. Mm -hmm. And you have lots of prominent individuals um, that are prominent at the local level, like Shay Medyun, who was one of our early leaders, and Clayton Turnbull, who's an early leader, and now John Barrows, who went, like like Sheena mentioned, resident, went through the neighborhood, and now is a leader in, in the city. And this is an opportunity to say, you know what? We feel good about what we did. Yeah. We faced some challenges, but we really took advantage of a lot of great opportunities. Right. So we started the year out with a community summit. Uh, and, and what I think was fascinating was that you had Mel King, mm -hmm. who ran for mayor uh, and put a really strong run 30 years ago, yep. approximately, and you had John Barrows, yeah. who just recently ran for mayor and put a very strong run in. And they were having a conversation about what it means to have a vibrant neighborhood now, what it, and what's the future of, 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 of Dudley, and what's the future of the city. Um, so that, that was the start, and we've done a few things throughout, and now not, we're... Not to interrupt you, but that would have been a really interesting conversation because, of course, Mel has such a different perspective yeah. than John because of right. just the sheer age difference. Exactly, exactly. So hearing from Mel what it was like for him when he ran and what the yep. city was like yeah. compared to today with Absolutely. John. So yeah. and, him, and him running really um, helped to move DSNI forward. Exactly. Right. I mean, it really created exactly. the space for that. Right. So. Yeah. That plus, it was a choice between you secede to Mandela, Massachusetts, or, uh, <laughs> or you paved the way for some other things. Exactly. Um, it, you know, and, and actually, that that conversation is recorded, so we have that, uh, and that's available. Oh, wow. So if you want to check it out, where is it? Can people get uh, it online? Uh, is it online yet? We'll make sure it gets yeah. online. Yeah. We'll get Put it, it online. Yeah. yeah, we have. We'll make sure it gets up. So, and we only um, have two minutes, by the way. Oh, great. Okay. Went by so fast. So, so 30th I'll be really anniversary quick. Uh, on on November seventh and eighth is our homecoming weekend. November seventh, we're screening our second uh, video mm -hmm. uh, documentary, which is called Gaining Ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a phenomenal documentary. And on the eighth, we're having our 30th anniversary gala, uh, and we're really really excited. It's going to be at UMass Boston. So. Yeah. We're, we want to see you all there. That's awesome. And if people want to go, there's information on the screen right now, and they can make sure they go and, and party with the folks of DSI. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so thank you so much both for being here. It was awesome to have you and to thank talk you. about DSNI. I think we could have gone for a whole <laughs> hour, but we won't. <laughs> next, time, next time. Next time. So thank you again. Thanks thank you, Seth. And we will be right back.